Good morning, and welcome to worship at St. Paul's United Church of Christ in Woodstock. No matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. While we aren't yet worshiping in our sanctuary together, when we worship our Lord, when we gather in Jesus' name, virtually or in person, we are promised that Jesus in, is in our midst. And quite frankly, the church is not just the building. The building is simply the house that holds the congregation, the church, which is the people. We are so happy that you are here. And I wanna give you an exciting announcement that on Sunday, August 23rd, we're going to be holding an outdoor, in-person Vesper service with masks and socially distanced on the grounds of Narrow Passage Inn, thanks to the generosity of Ed and Ellen Markle. We will make all the details available to you next Sunday, and that service is scheduled for 4 p.m. I ask that you would check and click on the worship bulletin so that you can access the children's moment other songs and other features of our service on our website. Just click on the worship link. Please ignore any advertisements that are in the YouTube links. They are not anything that we are promoting. We promote only Jesus. Our consistory is going to meet this Wednesday, August 12th at 7 p.m. And they're going to be making a determination about resuming in-person worship in our sanctuary with safety measures in place. And I do want to remind you that um, your donations to the church are always welcome. We continue to operate and provide ministry in many different ways, even though we aren't worshiping and having Sunday school classes and meetings in the building. And so we really value your donations. They can be made through Realm or PayPal, which are on our website. Realm is a vehicle which has very little overhead whatsoever for the church. It's very easy to use. PayPal does have a little bit more of an overhead for the church, and we appreciate those donations. You can also send them the old-fashioned way with a check in an envelope to the church office. And I also want to remind you and thank you um, not just for gifts of money. Those are incredibly important and valuable, not only for our church, but for all nonprofits in this time that are trying to care for people who are losing jobs or who have lost jobs. But in so many other ways, the things that you do, however small they may seem, whether it is talking to a neighbor on their porch or waving at someone across the fence, or whether it is dropping off a basket of homemade food for someone who you know has a sick family member and leaving it at the door, or working in the food bank, or any of those things, all of the kindnesses, letters and calls, all of those things are so amazingly important. They are the work of the church. And I thank you, and I know that God blesses those gifts and makes them so much more than we might imagine. Well, I ask now that you would join with me for our opening prayer. God of presence, as you walked on the water to meet the disciples, meet us in the storms in our lives. God of renewal, as you lifted Peter from the water, Lift us from despair to hope, from distraction to focus, from death to life. God of the journey, direct us in your way. Work out your purpose in and through our lives. This we pray in the name of Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Before the sermon, I wanted to give a couple words of thanks and, and offer for an opportunity to serve. First of all, we want to thank Emily Kuhn for our anthem today. I want to thank Mary Catlett for the awesome worship music that she selects each week. They are all inspiring and focused on our themes and a joy to watch. Thank you, Mary. And thanks to Craig Orndorff, who lent his radio voice to our scripture reading this week. Thank you, Craig, for that. The opportunity for service, um, we do have word that the Bread, Bread of Life Food Pantry here in Woodstock at the United Methodist Church is in need of two men to carry groceries from the pantry to people's cars a week from Thursday. If you want information about that, you can contact Becky Litton, who is our video producer sec and our secretary and our person who does everything else that you can't even imagine for more information. Well, it must have been a difficult and exhausting time for Jesus. He'd been rejected by his friends and neighbors in his hometown of Nazareth. And then he got the horrible news of Herod's arbitrary and gruesome beheading of his friend and cousin, John the Baptizer, the one who baptized Jesus into ministry, full of grief and likely full of fear about his own fate. Jesus withdrew from that place in a, in, in a boat to a deserted place. But we're told that people followed him around the lake and when he went ashore, he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them and he set about curing them. And when evening came, his disciples came to him and told him to send the crowds away so they could get something to eat. And Jesus said, you feed them, gulp. And then from five loaves and two fish that the disciples had on hand, Jesus fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. It was like a megachurch all the way back in those days. But still exhausted and grieving and needing time to care for himself, Jesus immediately, the text tells us, immediately sent the disciples ahead in a boat to the other side of the lake, and then he sent the crowds away and he went up the mountainside but once again to pray alone. Jesus' contemporaries were well versed in the rich symbolism and importance of water in the Hebrew scriptures. They were places of great danger as well as transformation. All the way back in the beginning in Genesis 1, 
We're told that the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the waters. That's a scary, provocative beginning of this great story of our salvation history. We're all familiar with the stories of the waters of the flood in the time of Noah and his ark. And then there was the crossing of the Red Sea as the Israelites escaped the clutches of slavery in Egypt. And then 40 years later, crossing the Jordan River at flood stage to enter the promised land. And then, of course, we know that Jesus was baptized in the water of that very same river. And we, when we are baptized with water, it is a sign and symbol of death into new life. We're told in the scripture when it was evening, Jesus was on the mountain alone. But already, by this time, the boat that the disciples were in was being battered by waves, and it was far from land, and the wind was blowing the boat further and further away from shore. I have to tell you that it's really easy to conflate all the different stories about the disciples in a boat in a storm and Jesus coming to the rescue. I've had to work really hard today to make sure I only use the one we're talking about in Matthew. You see, three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell of the occasion when Jesus was peacefully sleeping in the boat with the disciples as a storm came up at about three o'clock in the morning and the terrified disciples wake Jesus who calms the storm and their response is, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? And three of the four gospels, in this case, Matthew, Mark, and John, tell a second story. And in this story, once again, a fierce storm, waves and winds blow up, but this time, what is frightening to the disciples, who, by the way, some of whom were seasoned sailors, it wasn't the storm, but what terrified them was Jesus' appearance. They thought he was a ghost walking on the water. In Mark, it talks about, that the text implies and says that Jesus intends to pass the disciples by. But when the disciples cried out in fear, Jesus speaks to calm the, the, them and then gets into the boat and immediately the wind ceases. And in John's gospel, Jesus is walking towards the boat. Once again, the disciples are terrified, but he calls out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. And only then were they eager to let him in the boat. Here's where it gets really funny. Immediately, they arrived at their destination. That must have been really cool. Matthew is the only gospel which includes Peter in that story. We need to understand that Matthew's gospel was written to the followers of Jesus, mostly Jewish converts to Christianity, who were living in or near Jerusalem in the very dangerous and perilous years around the time of the fall and total destruction of Jerusalem. And so stories about Peter, the rock upon whom Jesus would build, build his church, were very important lessons to those persecuted, frightened followers. It's important for us as well, as we hold within ourselves doubt and faith in spades, like Peter. It's a lesson about God's never-ending love for us in the midst of our doubt. Now, this walking on the water wasn't the only impulsive thing that Peter did. Remember, when Jesus 
had asked his disciples, who did people think he was and then who did they think he was? Peter gets it right. He declares that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And then when Jesus said he was going to be betrayed and would die and be raised in three days, the very same Peter rebuked him and said, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. Ouch. Peter was the one who tried to come to the rescue of Jesus when he was turned over in the Garden of Gethsemane to his accusers. He cut off the ear of one of the palace slaves who was coming to make the arrest. And Jesus, rather than saying, keep going and knock them all dead, Jesus told him to put away his sword. He was the one who had told Jesus he would never deny him, and then denied him three times later that same evening. And at the end of John's gospel, he was the one who jumped out of the boat half naked upon seeing the, Jesus, the risen Jesus by the side of the sea. And he swam to shore, leaving the others behind to bring in the boat and the catch of fish. In Matthew 14, the disciples were already in a difficult situation. We know they were being battered by the waves. Actually, the Greek term is even worse than battered, it's tortured. They were, the boat was being tortured by the waves. But that's not what terrifies them. What terrifies them is Jesus walking on the water. They think it is a ghost and they cried out in fear and immediately Jesus said, take heart, it is I. That sounds like an odd way to say something. We'd say, hey, it's me. Don't worry about it, guys. But this is actually the use of the holy, unspeakable name that God uttered about God's self to Moses. I am. And then he says these amazing words, a phrase, by the way, which occurs all around 80 times in the Bible. Do not be afraid. Those are words to hold on to. But then impulsive Peter tests Jesus and he tests him with words that sound eerily familiar to the words uttered three times by the devil during Jesus' temptation. If you are the son of God, command, Satan said. And Peter says this, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. But Jesus doesn't command. He simply says, come. We might already be imagining that this isn't going to turn out well for Peter. For Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the water towards Jesus. But then he noticed the strong wind and he became frightened and he began to sink. Lord, save me, he cried. And immediately, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt that the I am would not let you sink? I have to tell you that up until a few years ago, I heard these words of Jesus spoken to Peter as harsh and condemning. But if we look in the scripture, Jesus uses the same phrase or similar phrases several times back in the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about God feeding or clothing the grass of the fields, how much more will God clothe you? Jesus uses these same words. O oh, you of little faith. He used them in Matthew 8 when he stilled the storm. And in Mark 9, a father came to Jesus begging that his son might be healed. And Jesus said, all things can be done for the one who believes. And then that man said, I believe, 
help my unbelief. The son, by the way, was healed. These are words of love, not of rebuke. They are encouragement that any amount of faith is faith. And we don't have to work up to enough. Jesus, if we go back to that scene, holding a very wet and sputtering and soaking wet and probably pretty embarrassed Peter, takes one last step on the water into the boat and immediately, the Bible tells us immediately, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. There's a book written by John Ortberg. It was written in 2001. It's a book about taking leaps of faith. And it, it actually won a Christianity Today's 2002 Book Award in Christian Living. The book is called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Need to Get Out of the Boat. It's, it's really a catching title. And I, numerous times I've thought about purchasing it, but then just, you know, my, my dad was Scottish, and I'm, I'm tight sometimes, and so I haven't yet. But, so I've never read it, but I like the title. And I have to say that as many times as I've read this passage in Matthew, it's always seemed to me to be the story of Peter's faith. After all, he was the only one brave enough to get out of the boat, and his only failure was paying more attention to the wind than to Jesus. It, it might be a great book, that book that Ortberg wrote, but I've become convinced that this passage is about Jesus and about the church. As early as the first century in the common era, Christians referred to the church as a boat. In 2011, I visited a kibbutz on, um, in Israel on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, where there's a museum that contains a boat that is affectionately referred to as the Jesus boat. The story behind the boat is that in 1986, two fishermen who lived on the Sea of Galilee, who were part of a long family tradition of fishing on the Sea of Galilee, were walking along the coast and, and they, there was a large drought and so some of the beach was more exposed than usual. And they stumbled on the remains of an ancient fishing boat that was 27 feet long, seven feet five, seven and a half feet wide, and had a height of about four and a third uh, feet high. That's been carbon dated to 40 before the common era, or in other plus or minus 80 years, or in other words, it fits in within the time frame of Jesus' life. And seeing that boat, what remains of it that's been preserved, how small and fragile it seemed has made all the stories of Jesus and boats in the Bible so much more alive for me. The Jesus boat in the museum then, and the church now, isn't a cruise ship. It's more a small, intimate, working vessel for those who have been called to be there. In our story from Matthew today, the disciples didn't decide to get in the boat after the feeding of the multitude. Jesus called them to get into the boat. The central portion of medieval churches in Europe, the part where the people gather, much like our sanctuary, was called the nave, which comes from the Latin word novice or boat. And like a boat, it is the place to hold a community of people gathered together for the same purpose. Its purpose isn't a launching pad for people to walk on water, but to support and encourage one another to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbor 
as they love themselves. They were committed to one simple gospel message, to simple acts of working together to provide for the needs before them. And in simple vessels with small crews carried the good news to all the world. That is a wonderful metaphor for the church. The waters that we are sailing in today are uncharted. Boy, they are rough. 160,000 of our country people have died from the coronavirus, and we find ourselves still far from the shore. We might fear that as the ancient maps used to write in the margins where the horizon was, Darby dragons, we might be tempted to jump ship. That happens far too often in the church when the going gets tough. This church is no exception to that. Like the disciples, when we are in this boat that is seems so imperiled, we are called to lament, to weep, to groan, to express our terror. And like Peter and the other disciples, we will doubt and trust and doubt and trust and doubt and trust again and again. Sometimes for me, I do that within a minute, multiple times daily in this season. My doubt and my faith seeming to blow like the waves of news that come and go. Listen to Jesus' words. Take heart. Do not be afraid. Those words can be heard over the winds. He isn't a ghost. He is our Lord. And even for one like Peter, who doubted, who even tested Jesus, there was and there is nothing absolutely nothing that will cause God to break God's covenant of love to us. Like the angel wrestling with Jacob, like the prodigal father who comes running to embrace the wayward son, Jesus reaches out his hands and he grasps Peter and brings him safely back on board. Jesus, the one who called us to this boat, to this community, to this commitment to love God and love others, Jesus is with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is with us in these rough seas, comforting us and calling us to find our little ways that we might save and serve those around us with the assurance that nothing in all of creation can separate us from that love. It is true, but may we know it to be so. Amen and amen. Please join me in prayer. Life seems to get crazy sometimes. We love the smooth times when all is well, but Lord, we have serious problems with wind and waves. We want you to fill our sails with a lovely breeze that will guide our little boats across the glassy sea. But you know that life isn't just glassy seas and gentle breezes. Sometimes, Things do get rough. Help us to place our trust in you in all of these rough times. You call us to reach out, to take our focus off of our own panic, and to place our trust in your love. And then you invite us to reach out to others with the same kind of love and compassion that you have given to us. 
Today, we have come to you with our burdens and our cares. Our seas are not calm, but you offer us a lifeline. Be with us, guide our lives, give us courage and hope, strengthen us to truly be your disciples. And in this few moments of silence, I ask, we ask that you lift all of those concerns and burdens in prayer to our Lord. All of these things that we pray, as well as the prayers that are more simply are groaning and moaning. All of these things we lift up in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, neither wind nor waves can swamp you. Place your trust in God's mercy and love, confident of God's presence and love for you and for all of creation. And may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.